Today we have Dr. Bupesh Prasti, who describes himself as a passionate molecular biologist and a believer in patient-orientated scientific research. Thank you for having me here today. Yeah. What first sparked your interest in research into ME? So as you mentioned, um, I am a virologist and um, I have been working on uh, many different types of viruses since the uh, last 20 years. Um, let's say last 10 to 12 years, I have been focused on uh, herpes viruses, many different types of uh, human herpes viruses. The most uh, common one for me is the human herpes virus type 6 and 7, but I also work with HSV1, EBV, CMV. So when um, we were working on um, these herpes viruses, we realized a very interesting um, uh, feature of uh, these herpes viruses, particularly the herpes virus type 6, that they have a very unique way of targeting mitochondria and they cause mitochondrial dysfunction. So I am always uh, interested in um, bringing the uh, research from the bench to the bedside. So basically, it should always be patient oriented. So I was wondering if there are certain diseases where mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the key feature. At the same time, it is also known that HHV6 or other herpes viruses might be involved. So when I was doing literature search, I found that there are actually many diseases, particularly the neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and um, other type of diseases like depression, bipolar, and things like that, where many herpes viruses have been uh, um, featured or known to be involved. But at the same time, mitochondrial dysfunction also is a key feature of these um, diseases. But no one ever have tried to connect both the dots. On one side, these herpes viruses, the other side, mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, I found MECFS pretty interesting in the beginning because my mentor, um, Dharam Ablasi, who is um, now almost 90 years old, he um, discovered HHV6 long time back. And in the early days, he published a couple of papers also that HHV6 might be involved in MECFS. It's uh, almost 35 years back. And since then, there are many papers um, where HHV6 and 7 have been frequently found in MECFS patients. And when I started working on this around six years ago or so, even there were a couple of researchers or clinicians who were trying to treat MECFS patients using anti herpes virus drugs. So I found it very interesting um, that I probably can connect the dot on one side, there is involvement of the virus, the other side, mitochondrial dysfunction. There must be some link. So I thought of uh, working on MECFS from there, but the path was not that easy because you know that uh, getting funding or starting to work with MECFS is absolutely uh, painful. Um, fortunately, um, I was in contact with um, Solf MECFS initiative at that time, and um, they encouraged me to apply for a grant. And I, um, and I applied and I got the uh, Ramsey grant. Um, that was the first year of Ramsey grant, I guess. So I got uh, 30,000 US dollar um, to work for one year, which was a um, small amount, but pretty nice to start with. So that was the beginning of my work with MECFS and herpes viruses, yeah. Very interesting. Well, I have to say congratulations on your two recent grants to mm -hmm. investigate the gaps in knowledge, knowledge between long COVID and ME. Are you able to tell us anything about that? Sure. Um, we got the first grant from um, ME Research UK, um, which, was, uh, which is a two-year project um, of... Uh, 207,000 pound roughly. Um, so within this project, what we are planning to do is um, we are going to cover one of these, as, as you know, that um, we work on 
potential serum derived factors which can cause mitochondria uh, to fragment or uh, bring the mitochondria to a hypometabolic state. And um, not only um, our work, work from other um, researchers in the field uh, have shown that um, probably autoantibodies play some role in uh, MECFS. So um, there are some autoantibodies which has been shown to be high in MECFS patients. We tested them and others also have tested them. We find it quite interesting, but we believe that they are not the full story. The story is much beyond than this. And we would like to search for autoantibodies which is not known or even pathogenic autoantibodies, autoantibodies which are coming from probably from viruses and uh, like. So within this uh, grant from MA Research UK, we will focus on finding um, uh, potential autoantibodies that can target uh, mitochondria for dysfunction. And um, hopefully we can um, take this to a much higher level where we can have a global approach of looking into um, thousands of autoantibodies in one sample at the same time. Uh, uh, following a um, much uh, um, um, advanced technology than uh, what we have known so far. Um, the second project is quite big and um, this project is very unique and very uh, interesting for us. Um, this project was fun or is funded by um, Amar Foundation from California. We got uh, 900,000 US dollar uh, for three years. We would um, like to understand the long COVID and the relationship of long COVID with MECFS. So far, everyone is talking about that long COVID patients are having symptoms which is similar to long COVID uh, for, to MECFS, but still there are no proven evidence that actually both the disease are the same. So we would like to have a unbiased molecular approach to understand what exactly going on in long COVID patients and what exactly going on in MECFS patients and can we bring them together and compare them. Uh, we would uh, follow a very unique experimental approach for this, which is developed in our lab, in our institute, um, we published a paper in Nature uh, Journal um, last year. This technology is called uh, SLAMSEC. Um, it's basically um, what we will do is that um, we will understand um, the um, different path pathways going on inside the cells at the single cell level. But this is not exactly the single cell transcriptomics studies probably some of the labs are still doing. The difference is that, for example, I just give you a very simple example. If I put you into a dark room and ask you the question that is the electricity working? So you would probably say no, or you will not be able to answer it because you don't know exactly whether it is on or off, switch is on or off, right? So most of the technologies that is available so far in the market will tell you whether it is dark or it's light, yeah? Our technology will go one step further where we will switch on and off and will tell you whether the light is working or not. Until you do that, you can actually cannot tell whether the electricity is working or the bulb is working or not, yeah? So this is basically in a layman language, the differences. So what we are going to do is we will collect blood samples from these patients and we will um, uh, isolate the blood cells, which will be population of all type of cells, B cells, T cells, natural killer cells, every cell type which is there. And then we will um, grow the uh, cells for a couple of hours, not longer, a couple of hours. And during this time, we will uh, feed the cells with a uh, modified uh, nucleotide which will get incorporated into the cells or into the RNA and then we will compare how much of RNA are produced within this time and then we will see whether the some of the pathways are working or not working whether the mitochondria is working not working so it will be 
one step ahead of normal single cell transcriptomics, which is very fascinating. We, we have been applying this technology to understand, for example, how coronavirus is um, infecting the cells and what type of changes it has been doing. So a lot of work is going on. So I thought of taking it to the clinic again. Um, we have been working from last one year uh, doing many different things in the lab, but I thought, okay, this is a nice opportunity that we can apply the technology to patients. Yeah. So fortunately, our idea was uh, encouraged I and mean, we got this fund, funding from um, US and uh, we are going to hopefully start the projects in next uh, two to three months time. And let's see how it goes. During your uh, research into me, what's the most surprising thing you've come across that surprised you as a virologist? Yeah, it's, it's um, I find, I mean, I have been involved in, um, with viruses from last 20 years, as I said. I worked for a long time with human papilloma virus. I worked with um, human endogenous retroviruses. I worked with um, um, hepatitis. I worked with uh, human herpes viruses. But I worked with, uh, I spent first 10 years of my scientific life uh, on cancer. And it's, you know, that cancer is a puzzle. It's a unique disease, unique condition. But this disease is one step more than that, ahead of it. You know, the disease is different from patients to patients. Even within the same family, two, three members are, family members are sick. Each one has different symptoms. Probably the cause is also different. There might be some genetic um, uh, background to the disease, um, but it is not exactly the same. Some are severe, some are mild, some are moderate. Definitely there is a link to pathogenic infection, but where is the pathogen? This is another puzzle. Yeah? People have been searching in the blood, serum, nothing is there. Uh, you know, where to, where to find it? This is, this is always like, a, you know, it's, um, and moreover, I find it very interesting is that there is clearly two different aspects to this disease. One is neurological aspect, and the other is the aspect of fatigue, yeah? It can be together, it can be separate. In some patients, it can be separate. In some patients, it goes together, yeah? When it comes to fatigue, fatigue can be um, post-viral um, after uh, treatment for cancer and the chemotherapy and things like that. But this fatigue is different. How come this fatigue is different? Why, from where the neurological part is coming? This is way too complex and I find it very exciting and interesting. I mean, um, from a scientist's point of view, this is the best place to be. Yeah. But leading on from that, where does scientific research need to go now? And what more needs to be done by the scientific community as a whole? I mean, we are still at the beginning, is not it? I mean, there is a long way to go. But I think the path is very exciting, encouraging, at least from a researcher's point of view. We have learned a lot during the past four to five years in comparison to the previous 20 years, 30 years. We are now trying to understand or we are now understanding which type of biological material should we test or what type of test we should do what exactly we should look for. I guess we are in the right path. Things have changed, at least if I see in the last four to five years, I have seen, um, I mean, getting 1 million um, euro to uh, do research, at least at a, a level where I am not belonging to the clinics, I'm not belonging to the ME research community, core community, but still getting this money and able to do uh, my work tells me that our work is appreciated and uh, this gives us excitement, encouragement to go ahead, yeah. And what would you say to researchers and scientists in the UK to encourage them to do research into ME? Yeah, this question has uh, two different answers probably. Um, I mean, the definition of scientific research is to search what is not known and 
this disease is a perfect example where a young scientist can have the true adrenaline rush. You know, the best part of a scientist's life is the excitement of doing something new, something different. And this is a perfect example. One can enjoy the science to the fullest. But if you want to enjoy science, then start working on MECFS. I would tell the, to the young scientific community in UK or any part of the world. Finally, do you have a message for people currently living with ME? Yeah. So I understand that people who are living with ME have a um, lot of frustrations, a lot of uh, pain, um, and a lot of um, hope from the medical community, from the search community. They all want to be healthy again, to live a normal life. And um, I'm sure things will change sooner, I guess. Um, the type of scientific work which is going on at this moment by not only in our lab, in other labs. And, and I find it very exciting and hopeful that um, within the next couple of years, let's say three to five years, not even, even if it's not longer, we will have something interesting, something exciting, which will bring new hopes, new ideas, new drugs possibly, new diagnostic methods. And um, I'm sure things will change. So have faith, have patience. Um, beyond this, I probably can't give much more hope than this. But um, being a scientist, I can tell that every day of my life, at least, I think about you. I think about the patients. I think about the pain, the suffering people around the world would be having on the same day. And I try to do as much as I can. I, sometimes we work for 20 hours a day. No one outside the lab knows about it. But most of the times things doesn't work. Most of the times, sometimes it work. I get excited. I come to Twitter or sometimes I tell people, okay, I got something new. But I know that um, maybe patients think that within the next two months, three months, six months, we will have a dramatic new idea, new thing, which will cure ME or MECFS. It's not like that. Our life is very difficult. We have to face lots of trouble to generate data. Once the data is generated to publish it so that everyone can see it, everyone can accept it. And it takes time. And this process is we cannot change it. And we have to follow, go through the, uh, this normal traditional way. And um, it will take time. But as I said, the development in the field is quite encouraging. So there is a hope. Thank you. Um, thank you for those words. Thank you for the research you're doing. You are appreciated by the ME community and patients. And thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you again for having me here. I'm delighted and very excited to be joined today by Ron Davis and Janet Defoe, who are well known throughout the ME community as Whitney Defoe's parents. Both Ron and Janet are desperate to find a cure for ME and save the millions missing across the world, starting with their son. Ron is a professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford University, and since Whitney's diagnosis, he's dedicated his work to understanding the disease. Janet is a licensed clinical psychologist who worked primarily with adolescents and children before staying at home to become a full-time carer for her son. Tracy White's book, Waiting for Superman, explores your quest as a family into the mysterious disease that's afflicting your son. Ron, can you tell us something about your, kind of your latest research? Is there anything that you can share with us? Well, I think our, our major, we have got several major focuses and, and some of this is uh, about trying to find either the cause of it uh, or just how we can treat it. And I would love to cure it because I think we can cure it. So that's the focus. And uh, our focus is not just collecting some data and publishing it and then going collecting more data and publishing it. Uh, we will give up certain things if we can't see how that will lead to a treatment. 
there's a limited amount of things we can do. So we're really focused on what, what we think can actually help patients. So when, uh, when we gave uh, my son Abilify, uh, it was really clear to us that it had a big effect. Uh, it, it, there needs to be a double blind study to validate that so other doctors will realize it. But I know it's true because I know how much we've tried to improve upon him with, with little effect. And the Abilify has had the biggest effect on him um, since he got sick. And so <clears throat> we're looking at what Abilify does. Uh, we will try to collect a lot of data on patients who are given Abilify and see what changes. Uh, the literature suggests that it changes dopamine. And so we are in a, in a deep dive into dopamine synthesis and all related uh, metabolic products uh, around dopamine and, uh, and auxiliary pathways of that type. So many of these have actually never been studied before uh, in MACFS. So we're setting up uh, that analysis and also developing the tools and technologies to measure uh, the com these compounds. And, and it, it, it gives us a real possibility that uh, we might have another, uh, another drug that we can develop. And, uh, and so we're actually working with a number of other uh, 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 scientists. Uh, there's a person who set up a company that's really helping us. And he's helping us uh, to get LabCorp to be able to measure some of the th critical things. And uh, that would be very important if it turns out this is important because then LabCorp patients could send things to LabCorp uh, and uh, they will make the measurements and then the doctors can use those. So uh, we're not there yet, but that's where our new effort is. Um, and I, I think it's a real good chance that it will have uh, a, a positive effect if we, if, if we can figure all this out. And uh, we track it all the way back into the mitochondria. And uh, that, uh, that actually suggests some things that might actually be going wrong in the mitochondria that have de has decreased mitochondrial function. So, uh, so that's sort of where our big effort is. It's all about metabolism at the moment. Uh, and uh, that's our guess is it is metabolism is the problem. Uh, there are probably some genetics that gives you susceptibility to disease. Um, but the, the nice thing about metabolism is that we can probably perturb it in many different ways, either by uh, natural occurring compounds that people are maybe missing in their metabolism or by drugs that will modulate. And uh, so that's why uh, I, I really think that the metabolism of things we need to really be focusing on. Uh, the other area, um, <clears throat> is that it looks like patients are suffering from an infection. Now, that's probably just the immune system uh, has been activated in some way, but we can't rule out that they have some kind of long-lasting infection. So we are continuing to uh, explore that. Uh, we will look for the DNA from the various organisms. We've done a lot of that work already and haven't found anything. Uh, Leon, Ian Lipkin has also looked for an infection and hasn't done anything, but we haven't exhausted it. So um, we're gonna look at all the DNA viruses, the RNA viruses, uh, all the parasites, uh, and, uh, and also funguses and bacteria. And we'll look for all of those. Uh, and I just think we have to keep looking and uh, uh, just because it, it might be there and we've missed it. So you've done quite a bit of that already. So you're doing something new now? Yeah, that was where, actually where we started. We said it probably is some kind of uh, uh, infectious organism that's in these patients that sort of looks like from the outside. And uh, that's where we started. And, and, but we haven't found anything. We've been doing this for quite a few years. And we've been developing new tools and technologies to do that. So uh, there is a possibility of, of a metabolic trap and uh, I, I, again, the, what probably is happening in the patients is they've gotten into some cycle uh, that they're locked into and can't get out of metabolically. So when we explore anything, we look for those kinds of locks. And, and one of them is, um, uh, is what we call the metabolic trap with tryptophan. So when you get an infection, uh, tryptophan is released from the albumin 
and it floods the immune cells. And then the immune cells convert the tryptophan uh, to canurinine. And that, that pathway is, is very important in cells uh, because it helps to regulate the immune system. Uh, but it has to be canurinine made inside of the immune cells, not canurinine in the plasma. And the community has gotten that all confused because they, you can measure canurinine in the plasma. And they say, well, there's a lot of canurinine. It makes, it's made by the liver. That doesn't matter because the import of canurinine into these cells is very, very slow. It has to be made in the cell. And it has to be made from tryptophan, which gets into the cell really quickly. But an unusual property of that conversion to canurinine is that enzyme, which is made by the IDO1 gene, is if the tryptophan in the cell gets too high, it can actually inhibit the enzyme. And the only way to get the enzyme reactivated is to get rid of the tryptophan. The only way to get rid of the tryptophan is for the enzyme to be active. Uh, that is where you're trapped. So- um, Let me just add something there. Normally, in normal healthy people, there's an IDO2 gene that keeps working and processing the tryptophan. But in these patients, that gene has mutations. So therefore, you're stuck when you have high tryptophan. There's nothing that can process the tryptophan into canurinine anymore. And that's why it, when normal people get sick and they get this high tryptophan and the IDO1 gene quits working because the tryptophan is high, they just switch over into the IDO2 gene and it keeps working fine. But in these patients, everyone they've measured so far, except with the possible exception of one, which is an unusual case, um, it quits. It doesn't work because there's um, mutations in that gene. And they've done like, how many people now? 70 or something. So, uh... <laughs> What we've done is that we've taken the human IDO1 gene mm -hmm. and placed it into baker's yeast and put it under a control of a promoter so we can change the level of it. And when we uh, turn that gene on and bring in, uh, put in tryptophan, uh, it will make canurinine. But if we block the enzyme, for example, by putting in a drug that inhibits the enzyme, then the tryptophan can accumulate. And when that happens, uh, uh, the, the tryptophan accumulates in the cell and it doesn't make canurinine. So, so what we've also then done is to, uh, you can convert canurinine into a compound called NAD. NAD is absolutely vital for lots of functions in cells, humans and yeast. In humans, it's involved in 400 reactions. So it's absolutely es uh, essential compound. And it's essential to make ATP, which is, is the energy source of the of cells. So we've taken out all of the ways that yeast can make uh, NAD except for using canurinine. So if it doesn't make canurinine, it can't make NAD. If it can't make NAD, it can't grow. So this is an assay for exactly what's happening. And, I'm not uh, sure that that's clear, that a human gene that they've put in there is the one that allows it to process tryptophan into canurinine and then NAD. And so they can see if the yeast is making NAD because they, they've taken out everything, every way that yeast can make NAD. So the only way it can make NAD is through this human gene that they've put in there. And when they raise canurinine, it stops working and the yeast doesn't grow anymore. So they've created the metabolic trap in yeast. They can put different drugs on there. And the cool thing about it is if you put a, sorry, Ron, but I think this is so amazing. If you put a drop of some drug on there, it kind of spreads out in concentric circles. And so you can look at where if, if NAD is growing and if it's growing at, you know, you can tell what concentration of the drug by what's happening with SA, NAD at the concentric circle places. And right. so that you can look, and he's gonna look at all different drugs and supplements by just putting drops on these plates of yeast that are stuck in the metabolic trap. So the other thing that we've done is that uh, we've taken uh, immune cells and then converted them to cells 
that will turn on IDO1 in the uh, macrophages. And, uh, and then if we inhibit that enzyme and put in tryptophan, so that if tryptophan can accumulate, and then we wash out the drug, they won't grow. So we've also demonstrated you can have a metabolic trap in, uh, in human cells as well. Now, uh, the, the human stuff is more difficult to work on, and so we'll continue to do the yeast. But if we can find a drug in yeast that seems to uh, reactivate the idea one, that's what we're looking for, then we can test to see whether it will reactivate it in the human cells. Now, Robert Fair is the person who we, we're collaborating with who, is a, uh, who does a lot of modeling, and this is absolutely vital. So we ask questions, and he can actually model this in the computer as to how the metabolism is working. Because all a lot of the uh, parameters of how, how fast the enzyme works and the things of this type are all known from past work. And that's where we looked at uh, the canurinane made by the liver. Can it get into the cells? No, <laughs> you can model this. It has to compete with the tryptophan and it, it, you just simply can't get enough in. So uh, it, it answers a lot of questions without doing experiments. So uh, at least the metabolic trap is feasible. We don't know how long it can may remain trapped and that will be another experiment that we'll do. We'll set them up and see if they can remain trapped for a very long time. So we'll, we'll screen all the FDA approved drugs and we'll, uh, and we'll screen herbal extracts. The reason for doing those is that uh, they could become available very, very quickly for patients. If we wanted to reactivate it and do chemistry and find a new drug, uh, you're talking about probably around a billion dollars and at least 10 years of research to get that approved. And I just don't want to go that direction. If a company wants to do it, that's just fine. But if we can demonstrate that it's important and, uh, and the, the, the things we find don't work super well, it would be encouraging for a drug company to try it. But I want to, have, I want to find something that can actually uh, treat the patients. Now, my guess is if this is all correct, then this is the primary cause for MECFS. And once you reactivate the enzyme and you, re you, uh, you reduce the tryptophan uh, and, then, uh, and then produce canurinine, that will then uh, re-regulate the immune system and the patients will be completely normal. Now, also what's interesting is you can model how fast, if we could reactivate the idea of one gene, how fast would the patients recover? And it would be basically overnight. So you could give them in the evening the drug and in the morning they'll be totally cured. That's one of Rob Fair's models, yes. Now, you always have to, <laughs> you, you try to do that so you have an idea what you're doing and what you want to look for. The modeling is very important. It doesn't prove that it's right, but it makes us so that we don't um, make a, a misunderstanding. Uh, so for example, if, if it told us it would take uh, a week or two weeks or something of that type, then we wouldn't uh, jump to conclusions after a few days. I mean, if it if it does turn out that 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 could be the way forward, that would be life changing for millions of people all across the world. But it sounds like there's an awful lot kind of going on in the research from your side of things. But what would you say to scientists and researchers in the UK? What would you say to them to try to get them to possibly do more? Well, I would try to urge them to do the same strategy that I'm doing in terms of finding out um, uh, you know, what could actually help the patients and focus their efforts on that and not necessarily a, a publication. Uh, there's so little money in this that we can't afford to uh, uh, do things that aren't productive in terms of leading to a, a treatment. It's gonna be really hard. There's so little money and so little effort. It's going to be really, really hard. So that's why we have to uh, constantly think about this and try to figure out ways to streamline it and, and work a little faster. Often I feel... Also, we would also say to the UK people uh, to stop doing any kind of research on the lightning process and graded exercise and CBT, uh, with the possible exception of CBT, helping people cope with having such a terrible illness. 
and um, also help them to just stop spending money on those things which have been sh shown to be not effective already and just get off their belief that somehow they're helping, which they aren't. Now have the scientists get to the UK physicians that it's okay to try some things like giving people a saline drip or maybe giving people a Bilify because in the UK it is so hard for patients to get any kind of treatment at all. In the UK, even the physicians who are enlightened about it can't do it because it's, it's, they'll lose their license or something. And also, it's true there's no treatment for ME-CFS it, itself, but there are treatments for some of the symptoms mm -hmm. and that's what should be focused on right now. And looking at the United States Clinician Coalition guidelines, they've just put out some treatment guidelines just the, in the last few days. And um, there's all kinds of ideas in there on ways to treat the symptoms, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that the disease will go away, but it does mean that some people will get an alleviation of some of their suffering. And it's, it's improving the quality of life and to be able to have that, the freedom for kind of doctors in the UK to be able to even offer that would, would make a huge difference to, to so many people's lives over here. ME affects the whole family it affects both of you and, and the rest of your family as well. What is it, what challenges do carers of people with ME face? Well, uh, I think, you know, one of the issues is the fact that uh, there isn't any kind of uh, infrastructure that actually helps those patients. You can't take them to a hospital because the doctors, most of the doctors aren't trained how to treat them. There's a few people are, but uh, that are trained, a few doctors, but not many. It's not very well taught in medical school. And if, if it is mentioned in medical school, it's often um, misinformation like it is around the rest of the world. So uh, if you have a severe patient, you can't take them to the hospital. If you do, they're gonna get worse because they will not treat them correctly and they'll think that they know what they're doing and they don't. So uh, the patients are stuck uh, being treated at home. I mean, this is really barbaric throughout the world. So uh, if gonna... you had a special facility that could handle them or a special division of the, in the hospital, uh, you know, you can have a tuberculosis patient, you know what to do with them. We know enough of how to treat these patients, but the training isn't there. And so you wind up being at home and if, if someone has to take care of them, usually a loved one. At, 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 and in this case, uh, my wife is the one who takes care of them, uh, takes charge of almost all the care and that she can't work anymore. And Janet, how does it affect you? Well, I want to go back a little bit and say it starts out affecting you by having your family member not even know what's wrong with them and spend a lot of time with all kinds of symptoms that are mysterious and going from doctor to doctor and feeling horrible and having no idea what's wrong. And then once you get a diagnosis, then it goes to people not believing you or even before that people don't believe you. So they lose their friends their, and people just don't understand it. So the first thing is that you need to believe people that they actually have an illness and then what comes up is what Ron is talking about is you go and nobody knows how to treat it. And then you get to the point where you're bedridden and you can't go to the doctor and there's no home care and doctors won't come to your home usually. So we've gotten lucky and had some doctors who will come to our home. And even in our area, a part of the reason for that is because of Ron and they respect Ron. So they'll make an exception, right? Mm -hmm. um, so home care needs to be really re-looked at for people who can't leave their home without getting worse. And it just, you know, it just takes over your life because there's so many medications you have to keep track of and you're always worried, like with lines in, in their bloodstream that they get infections and then you're panicking because it could be sepsis and then you're panicking because you could have to take them to the ER if they have sepsis and that would be so bad for the MECFS. And uh, the other thing is they're so sensitive to sensory stimuli that it's very difficult to take care of them without making them worse. 
So if people don't know, if you do any kind of exercise or mental, any kind of expenditure of energy, whether it be physical or mental or emotional, it can make you worse. And when you're really bad, um, it hardly takes anything for that to happen. So um, it, it's very important to try not to crash, which happens when you exceed your energy. Um, but when you have so little energy, even just coming into your room, into their room can make them crash or any little thing. And uh, that is really hard to be a caregiver when what you're doing to carefully take care of your son is hurting them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so emotionally difficult. And they have an emotional reaction to that too and think you're making them worse. And then I'm, you know, who've given up my life taking care of him and making him worse. And he's upset with me. And, you know, he understands that I'm not doing that on purpose or anything, but it's just so emotionally difficult. Uh, it, physically and emotionally, it's a lot, isn't it? It's draining for, for everybody involved. And then I have to say, even we kind of lose our friends. I mean, I think they just don't know what to do around us because we're so involved in our own son care. And then with the whole issue all over the world, Ron with the research and me trying to connect with people and stay on social media, encourage people, um, pass along information, be empathetic and, and loving towards all these people and trying to help them as much as I can. It, my life is consumed by this and uh, it, I almost feel like I don't wanna go around with my friends anymore because it's hard. It's like, it's a different world. You're just in a different world mm -hmm. and they can't understand it. And I don't know what to say <laughs> to people, you know? I think when Emmy has affected a family, it almost forces the family to become quite insular because it's hard for other people to understand, but also all your energies goes on to right. supporting each other. And I think the, the ME community take so much comfort in seeing all the work that your family are doing, but also you're so brave in sharing stuff kind of unfiltered. You know, we, we, we see Whitney at his worst and we see the effect that it has on all of you guys. And I think that's really important for raising awareness, but also for, for kind of showing and supporting other families as well. I know it means a lot to people, but what would you say to the, to the ME community? Do you have a message for the ME community? Well, one of them, I think, is, uh, you know, we, re we were really working very hard on trying to figure this out, and I'm trying to recruit other people. Uh, I've gotten an awful lot of people at Stanford who do at least some little work on, on, on MECFS. Uh, Mark Davis, who's not related to me, but he's a fab fabulous immunologist. So now we're doing a number of projects uh, together. We have a, 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 basically, he got the grant, but... Uh, uh, we're providing him with patients because he doesn't know how to go out doing that. Um, and so uh, we're finding out a lot about the immune system with his work. And there's a lot of things that are different. He's finding unique types of cells in the patients. And uh, we're trying to figure out what they do. But some of that focus is on the uh, autoantibodies that are found in the patients. Uh, and we're trying to understand where that's coming from. Anyway, just uh, just making a big effort to recruit other people to do this. So part of that is to all the data that we collect, we put up on a server uh, so, so everybody can access it. We had to poke a hole in the firewall at Stanford to get it outside of the firewall so people could then access that information. There's a lot of data there. And um, you know, like all the sequencing data and all the metabolomics data. And there are quite a few people throughout the world that are using that data. Uh, uh, it's much more data than we can actually, you know, analyze by ourselves. So just sharing our information helps. We just really want people to have hope. And we've got Ashley working on helping with the communications and Ron focusing on the science and Whitney focusing on being a, a, an example, I guess, for the patients to hang on. And, and I try to just instill hope by, by uh, giving out information and 
Sometimes I call people up just to help them out with the things that I do know about. And, you know, I'm painfully aware of how slow this is. You know, I think Ron, when he began, he thought he was going to be able to figure that, this out faster. But science, it's very complicated and science isn't a fast thing. And what Ron is doing is often creating things that have never, ever been done before. He's not just using existing techniques and making measurements. He's creating things. And there's always bugs and things that set you back. And it's so upsetting to me. I'm always bugging him like, come on, did you figure out anything today? But I do have hope, even though it's slow. And that's my message to everyone out there is that there is hope. It, I know that it's taking longer than you'd like, and there's a lot of suffering involved in that timeline, but there is hope that eventually we're going to, A, do something to help the symptoms, and B, even cure the disease. And um, so that's, that's my message to the community, is to just hang in there and fight like heck to get things that can help your symptoms and... Uh, you know, work on having gratitude for the things that you do have in your life that you appreciate and be in the moment and try to find some little piece of joy or something that um, is good for you in the moment and try not to focus on, you know, the future or the past and try to exist in a way that um, helps you find some kind of, uh, little pieces of joy or gratitude right in the moment. And I think that can help you get through day by day, one at a time, one day at a time. Not easy, but a good thing to really try to do. And then there's one other thing that's just really exciting is that uh, there is a journal called Healthcare that has a, um, that, and they're working on a, an issue that is dedicated to severe ME-CFS. And we were contacted to see if Whitney would like to put some of his blogs together in an article for that journal. And Whitney got excited about that and he did it. And he's put a lot of effort into this. And there are things in there that describing his experience and what severe CFS is that has never been told to the community before ever. And the editor is quite excited to get that out there and um, to get the medical world to know what it's like to have severe a CFS and to get medicine to um, work on how you might treat some of these things. All of these things I think go together for helping with understanding and giving people hope. So that's my biggest message is hang in there. And we love you, really. That's, that's lovely. And I think Whitney sharing, you know, it, it, it's, he's sharing himself, isn't he, in, in what's going to come in a few weeks. And that's such a brave thing for him to do. But it, it really will help people who haven't got experience of the disease to, to hopefully understand more. But it also will bring comfort to, to people who have experience with the disease because they'll know that actually they're not alone. Well, a lot of times uh, doctors and uh, other non-doctors tell the patients that they're crazy and that there's nothing wrong with them. So I think that kind of overwhelms them as well with some doubt. Maybe I, uh, maybe I am crazy, you know, and uh, I've talked to so many patients when uh, you know, telling them that it's a real disease. You can, you, you can see this at the molecular level. There's a lot of things that are wrong, a very large number of things that are wrong. And um, it's not imaginary. And so some of them just have, well, they get kind of really relieved. So I think that's one of the problems is that the, the, they're, and that's why I think they don't talk about it because they're a little, they feel in, a little embarrassed that they have this imaginary disease. And so th that's, that creates some of the problems in itself. Uh, this is a common disease. Uh, and the people who aren't very severe, who can walk, who can go outside of the home, um, they don't talk about that they have this and they don't look sick. So nobody would recognize that, that, that they've met a lot of people with this disease. We don't want them to start from scratch. You know, they need to start from the knowledge that there is already. Mm -hmm. 
And one thing that's scary to me is that I think there's a possibility that if you got these patients early on, that we could actually get them over it. Mm -hmm. So there's another disease um, called PANS. It's, it's in very young children, has a lot of the same symptoms as caused by a strep infection, they think. Uh, so it's very similar by caused by a disease onset. Uh, there's a there's a PANS uh, clinic here at Stanford, and uh, Jennifer Frankovich runs that, and she says that if I can get the patients within the first year, I can get them over it with high steroid concentrations, but after a year, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that makes me very nervous that we have a year to find something that can get the COVID nineteen patients over it. So if anyone with long COVID is watching this interview, what I say to you is rest. Do not go over your energy limits, no matter what. Do everything you can to avoid that. And if you go to any doctor who says that you should exercise, leave. Just go away from that doctor. They don't know what they're talking about. And this is not anxiety or depression or malingering. Uh, it is a, a risk that, that you could have this and it wouldn't go away. And the best thing that we know to prevent that from happening is to rest and do not go over your energy envelope for any reason. Fantastic. Well, thank you both of you for taking the time to speak to me today. Um, I know that a lot of people will be very excited to hear from you and to listen to this interview. So I really do appreciate it. Um, but. Thank you ever so much and hopefully we'll chat again soon. Thank you so much for doing thank you. To yeah, thank you. for everything you do. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we're joined today by Professor Sarah Tyson, who is a physiotherapist and professor of rehabilitation at the University of Manchester. I understand you're involved in a research study um, that will examine the feasibility of uh, measuring various physiological data during daily activity in people with ME. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's the project's actually led by Dr. Nicola Plague Baker in the University of Leicester. I'm actually the patient and public involvement representative in the study, which is a, a new role for me. Well, it's known that people with ME, uh, they don't have enough energy, they're fatigued because their mitochondria, the, the parts of your body cells that produce the energy, they're not working effectively. And so what's called the aerobic threshold um, is very much lower for people with their need than it is for healthy people. Um, and one of the cardinal signs of um, MECSF is that although somebody with ME can exercise once, so that they may well be able to do some activity or exercise, but then they re re use up all the energy they've got and it isn't replenished in the way that it is in a healthy person. So in the States, the Work Well Foundation in the States have developed what's called the cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is um, a test where the person exercises to their maximum extent and for someone with ME, that if you test it, if you do that once, that will be or can be normal or close to normal. So we can produce some activity for a short period. This is in, this isn't for people with very severe ME. They can't do this at all. Uh, but in, in somebody with less severe ME, that we, we can produce energy for a short period. Um, but then the, the cardinal sign of uh, MECSF is if you repeat that test the next day, 24 hours later, we can't reproduce it because our energy production capacity has been exhausted and it hasn't recovered. And that's what causes post-exertional malaise, which is often considered the cardinal sign of MECSF. And in the States, that cardiopulmonary exercise testing is used over two days, is used as a diagnostic test for MECSF. But many people are reluctant to do it, and it can have really un un unpleasant consequences because doing that testing twice 
can kick off post-exertional malaise. So what we wanted to do is to find out whether it might be possible to do that testing or that level of testing to see whether one's aerobic threshold is, or whether people with ME, whether their aerobic threshold is lower and whether is it exceeded just doing everyday activities. Um, so if that was so, then we may be able to uh, develop the test further so that we could do it just doing everyday activities rather than having to go through this maximal exertion uh, exercise testing, which is, it, even for a healthy person, it's not terribly pleasant to do. You feel like you've been through the ringer by the time you've, you've done it. Um, so yes, we wanted to see if people were getting up to that sort of aerobic threshold um, during everyday activities and whether we might be able to then develop the test. So it was much easier, quicker, therefore cheaper, but also less um, risky, if you like, to do. Um, and it would also tell us if, um, so following on from the exercise testing and this, this um, uh, finding that people are people with ME, their aerobic threshold is, is so low that they're going through it, they're going above it in everyday activities. And so um, there's a way of doing pacing by monitoring your heart rate, which is one of the things I personally have found really useful. So you keep your heart rate below your aerobic threshold. Um, and that's, that's a way of, of, of pacing. So we wanted to know essentially what um, patients, what was happening to patients' heart rates and their aerobic thresholds during everyday activities. But the, the issue with um, people with ME and CSF is it all gets really complicated because there's A, such a range of severities uh, and B, such a range of the difficulties that people have. So um, we, when we stopped and thought about it, we thought, well, we can't prescribe the tests that people would do or the activities that people would do because it would be varied so we, we wanted to investigate the kind of range of activities that we might need to involve. We wanted to look at how feasible it is for, for um, patients to use the testing equipment. So for example, you, you would um, have a, heart, um, a chest monitor, a, a heart monitor that's attached by a chest strap. But if people have a lot of sensitivities and allergies, then that's rubber and that might might set people off or it, you know, some people, will, if they're hypersensitive, will find it too, too tight and uncomfortable. Um, so we had a, a lot of questions about how, how we could do this to make it feasible, um, and particularly for people with more severe ME, um, to what extent it was feasible and reasonable to try to do it. So that, that, that's the background to why we wanted to do it. And, with this initial study is very much focusing on working out how we can do it in a way that's acceptable for people with ME and CSF, and also gets us the data that we need. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, this feasibility study is all about working out how to, how to do it, or even if it's possible to do at all, we may find that it's, it's just not possible. Um, so we were all ready to go and then of course the pandemic hits so that's put, put a, a, um, well we're, we're almost ready to go again for when uh, lockdown lifts but obviously we can't be going into patients homes and things while there's any risk so uh, we've, had, we've had to put a, a block on it for well about a year really. What do you think the key issues are then in, um, in training healthcare professionals about ME? Um, raising awareness within the healthcare environment. Um, that's, mm, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think, well, uh, look, the main thing about healthcare professionals um, is they're really not taught anything about anything about fatigue or MACSF usually, um, or they 
if they are, it's often lumped in with what's called medical unexplained symptoms or functional neurological disorders and things. Um, as so people often aren't taught anything about it really. Uh, and what they know, unless they have personal experience of it one way or another, is very often picked up from the attitudes and experiences of other people, other clinicians. Most healthcare professionals, if they know anything that, about it, it's probably tends towards the old fashioned view that it's psychosomatic and rather odd and we're rather neurotic. I think that's really changing now, actually. And, and I think co long COVID has had a big, big influence on that. Um, and certainly so the, the, uh, the research study that I've done, uh, that I'm doing, um, is with Physios for ME, a group you may know who've been doing fantastic work um, to raise awareness amongst physios particularly, but all healthcare professionals on the importance of post-exertional malaise and how to do um, activity management and pacing uh, with, by staying within what, what the Americans would call your energy envelope. So I, and certainly I've been really impressed with the interest and the um, uptake there has been of the work they've done within physio communities and, and occupational therapists as well. Um, so I think the, there's an element of pushing an open door, I think. And I think COVID's made a big difference with that. Clinicians are, they're in a difficult position because I know I haven't had huge amounts of contact with people who deliver MECSF services, but I've had some, and certainly the ones that I've met are very clear that this is a genuine um, organic physical um, illness and, you know, are, are very irritated and frustrated by people talking nonsense about it being psychosomatic, uh, but they, as professionals, they, uh, and they are commissioned to deliver and to use the, NA, uh, the NICE guidelines or whatever clinical guidelines there are, that, that you know, their service is, commit, is, is funded to, to use what is considered or was considered the best evidence. So they have to kind of be seen to be doing graded exercise. Um, uh, and CBT to some extent. Um, do you think that people with ME should have a role in the training of the healthcare professionals? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, it's certainly an accepted and expected element. Certainly, I mean, for, for a long time, there have, it's been patchy, but, um, there have been uh, patients being involved in the teaching uh, of healthcare professionals uh, for a long time. So I was doing it about 20 years ago, but then it was, um, it, it, it was kind of cutting edge. Whereas now, nowadays, I don't think a, um, a curriculum would get validated by the healthcare, uh, the uh, appropriate regulating authorities if it hadn't had some involvement of patients and the public because ME is such a hot topic if you like and it, it's um, it's an area where uh, the patient patient's voice is particularly strong I mean it, it, to me it's a, a topic and an area that um, has to be one of the highest priorities to include um, patients.